Thank you so much for making time, making a priority to honor Kevin this evening. We are so excited to celebrate Kevin's time here. And I'm grateful on behalf of our church and all of us who need a great deal of grace. Kevin, I just wanna thank you for the drumbeat of grace. But most of all, you know, as great a teacher as you are and as great a leader as you are, you're a shepherd. Uh, I understand that word in a very different way because I know you. I just wanna say well done. I just wanna say well done. Heavenly Lord, today we're thanking you for a life well lived. Kevin is a shepherd, and we know that that's after God's own heart. God says that we give honor where honor is due, and there's a great deal of honor due men and women like Kevin and Ginger Oak. Thank you, thank you, I hear you, but you're taking up my time. Uh, so sit down, thanks. Uh, it is so, uh, it's been so meaningful to be honored this weekend, and this is a weekend that was made for honor, and Drew did a great job of focusing our thoughts on uh, what Jesus did on the cross, but also what men and women have done for our country, and so I thought it'd be appropriate at this moment, uh, in this weekend where we're honoring to honor those who have served in our military, are serving or have served, and if you and your spouse would please stand so we can honor you today with a round of applause. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you for serving. December 20th, 1992. Uh, there were two 35 and a half year old parents, a 10 year old, almost 11 year old girl, a six and a half year old son, and a two year old little girl, and a cat and a goldfish <laughs> that were in a car that was cresting the hill from Boulder City coming down to the city of Las Vegas. And knowing that that is where our life was going to unfold, that's where the unknown was going to become known, it was so much uncertainty. But it was a change and was coming to us. And a lot of people come to Vegas looking for a big win. And all I can say is we hit the jackpot. We just did. We were intimidated by the city's reputation. We were anxious because we knew we needed to meet new people and make new friends and new traditions and find new dentists and new doctors and all the stuff of change, and change was coming, but we were embracing it, and here we are 26 and a half years later, and that little 10, almost 11-year-old girl had married a native Las Vegas guy. <laughs> Didn't see that coming. They've been married 13 years, and we have twin 11-year-old grandsons and seven-year-old grandson from that family, which we're so grateful for. That six and a half-year-old young boy is now, he's, he and his wife will be married 10 years in August, and we have a five-year-old and a two-year-old and a five-month-old grandson, a five-boy girl, boy, <laughs> our only granddaughter, thank you. And man, what a change. And then that two-year-old little girl is now 28, and she's a Clark County high school English teacher. Yeah, and here we are. <laughs> and and that, those two 35-and-a-half-year-olds, are gonna be celebrating 40 years of marriage in August, which is amazing. And I'm updating you with that story because we've lived life with you. We've lived our life with you. And as we got started with this God thing called Canyon Ridge, and that's a phrase, God thing, that I cherish because we didn't know how else to describe it and it was a quick way of explaining. 
that God was up to something and we were joining him and there were things that occurred, open doors that happened that we moved forward on this great adventure. And the first phase was at the YMCA across from Meadows Mall and that's where we launched, that's where we started and uh, God blessed us there and we grew from 600 to about 900 people as a church family. Um, it was a bizarre place. The two major smells were chlorine and coffee. That's what I remember. We had an Olympic-sized baptistry. Our children's ministry was in racquetball courts. Very illegal, but we never told anybody. And uh, as far as there's only one exit and entrance. Anyway, don't worry about it. We, no kids were lost. And uh, we outgrew and then eventually moved to Cimarron High School. And just as you know, we were the first, you may not know, we were the first church to meet in a school in the state of Nevada. There was some state uh, school board policy that was kind of obscure, and a, so a U.S. Supreme Court, Supreme Court decision allowed equal access that rippled all the way to, for nonprofits, all the way to our nonprofit church. Because we were first in line, Clark County had to learn how to deal with churches in their school on Sunday. We were the pioneers. So every church in town that meets in a school, you, you just tell them that, thank us, because we, uh, <laughs> we led the way. And that was uh, pretty cool. So we were at Cimarron High School for four years, and God grew us there. In the middle of that season was our first major crisis as a church, major crisis. We had lots of challenges along the way, but the major crisis, when Mike Bro, our founding senior pastor, uh, took a call to go back to Kentucky and left us in the desert trying to build our first building and stay as a church, and we were running about 1,400 people at the time. And it was scary, but God, the God thing kept going. And we figured out a way, and eventually in Easter Sunday of 1998, we moved into this auditorium, the first phase of the building on this campus, and it was such a victory. One of the things we did, for those of you who don't know, just a little history, because we wanted God's word to be the first thing proclaimed in this new space, symbolically, as we were trying to get our certific certificate of occup occupancy permit in time for move-in, the construction company was frantically putting last touches on things, and we were waiting for the time that we could finally read the Bible out loud, and it turns out to be Wednesday before church on Saturday. And so we're like, oh man, what are we gonna do? And uh, we started 24 hours. We read through the Bible from Genesis 1 to the last chapter of Revelation, out loud in this space. Family signed up 24 hours. Can you, that was one of the coolest things. And just so you know, the, the elder that was in charge of that project timed it so that when the first service started, we had the last three chapters of Revelation to go for the last 15 minutes, and we finished it just before we started. And that's kind of a cool thing, and we've continued that tradition with our other buildings. We also wrote scripture underneath the carpet and on, underneath this paint and uh, on the walls underneath the paint so that this, the church would be built on the Word of God. You see, the Word of God has lasted, and buildings tend not to. And we wanted to make sure that the thing that we were building this church on was this eternal truth of God. Very symbolic, pretty awesome. It's a great memory. And just so some of you that are new or know that, the pioneers of the early church, of the early uh, leaders of our church, they did that. Uh, the next phase uh, was the, around the year 2000, where we launched The Crossing. And Shane Phillip, who had been on staff six years, is the lead pastor still at The Crossing. And that church is thriving on the southwest side of town. And we sent a whole bunch of folks in that direction, and God has blessed that. We also entered into what we called Chapter 2, and we built, uh, we built the canyons right away, and then we built the, uh, those three classrooms, and then we built the office building. And that has provided much-needed space, and we lived that way for a while. Then there was a second tragedy that struck our church, but it didn't just strike our church, it struck the nation, and that was September 11, 2001. And when September 11 happened, it brought the, the nation to its knees and the churches were filled and we had a bumper crowd attendance that weekend and there was real fear and real faith that was expressed. And it was an honor as a church to help lead that effort of helping people through that tra tragedy. Uh, then eventually, we needed to expand because our church family was busting at the seams and so we built the base camp and we expanded the 1,200 seats to 3,000 seats it was called Now and Forever, and we're changing people's now, and, we're, and it's lasting into forever, so how can we do that? We need more space, so we sacrificially gave, but that led to another crisis in our church. After our fundraiser, we counted up the, the commitments, and we realized that we were short, 
of the finances to move forward. So what are we going to do? So we paused for a year. We paused and we prayed and we thought and we strategized and eventually became clear to move forward with a particular strategy that led to this expansion. And that was a, a yay God thing as the God thing continued. And opening up base camp and the, and the extra space and the parking was absolutely right. Another phase of our church was because we expanded, uh, we had brought in the cameras and that allowed us to do things online. And so our online campus started in 2013. And then the next year, we did this thing called Spark, which helped us uh, have a, a chapel facility. And that chapel has been a place for the divine intersection of God's grace and people's need in weddings and funerals and other events. And we now, because of that chapel, were able to open the tradition service in 2015. In 2014, we launched Centennial Hills as a campus. And that was awesome. And then another tragedy hit us as a church because it hit our town, October 1, 2017. And we as a church family reached out and led in efforts of ministering to folks that were wounded and shot and hurt and needed healing. And the services that we held here and in other places were so helpful to the heart of our city. And I was very grateful and proud of how we responded. And then in 2018, we launched the Providence Campus. All those stepping stones are just snapshots of this God thing where time and time again we saw obstacles, we prayed, we worked hard, and there was an open door and we walked through and God kept advancing his cause through the leadership of our church and we we're so grateful for that. I'm grateful for how we latched on to global missions, not just in the northwest corner of this town where we believe God called us primarily, but we have sent people from here around the globe and I remember the years that we launched Russell and Sidney Bridges and Dan and Darla Perryman who when they signed up to be sent out from our church, it was 10 years to life. They're in their 11th and 12th year now. And they're doing faithful ministry in Burma and India because of the faithful support of our church, both emotionally and with prayer and with finances. And that's an awesome heritage. I'm so grateful for the care ministry that was started in our church and how it has grown into this robust outreach of our church where our Celebrate Recovery ministry literally has two, 250, 300 folks on Friday night that are hungry for health, and they come broken and supportive of each other to get free of addictions. I'm grateful for our church counseling ministry and how many free counseling hours are dispersed to needy families and individuals who need their lives helped by God's grace. I'm so grateful for the robust care ministry. And overall, I see the changed lives. I see the baptisms, 10,250 plus baptisms. I see the people that weren't married that are now married. Those that were married and were in crisis have now been restored. I see families that are healthier. I see people freedom from, free from addiction. And I see individual after individual who's living life on purpose for a purpose. And truly the God thing has been an awesome thing to be a part of. And there's a verse that we lean into for a lot of our decades here and it's found in Ephesians 3.20, and this is how I feel. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that has worked within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever, amen. And the people said, amen. Wow. It's been a great run. It's been a great run. We hit the jackpot. More than can ask, dream, or imagine. Oh, and by the way, um, this is my last talk, and that's a dangerous thing, to give an exiting employee one more shot at the mic. <laughs> I've thought a lot about this message for a long time. This is the time to set the record straight. This is the time to go on a rant or two, because I've always wanted to, and I didn't want to lose my job. <laughs> All that kind of thing. And uh, it has expanded and contracted and expanded and contracted and, and hopefully uh, what I'm going to share is, is I hope overall is a blessing to you. Uh, but it's been, uh, the first part I hope you understand is I want to express the joy it has been to be part of this God thing. There are some things I want you to remember, some things that have been taught, some themes that I've shared through the years that I hope you always remember. So I'm going to share a few of those, remind you of them just in case. You know what I want you to remember? The story of the prodigal son. 
I can be blamed as the guy that wore the prodigal son story out, that I just wore it out. I talked about it, referenced it for so many times. I, I'll stand guilty with gratitude. Remember me as the prodigal son story guy that wore it out and made you tired of the story, okay? I'll take that. And you know why I did? It's my story. It's my story. But it's also your story. It is the universal that brings everyone, people that are coming to Las Vegas intimidated by the city, arriving here with the heart of, I'm the prodigal son going to help other prodigals find grace. That's my calling and that's what I've done. Because I am a prodigal. And all of us are because we knew right. We were raised in a way that our moral conscience was developed like this is the right thing to do, the right way to live. And rightness connects to God. So in the big picture, we were raised to do good in God's way. But we saw wrong, were tempted by wrong, chose wrong, did wrong. And often what we were choosing to do ended us up in a pig pen of our own choices in a place that was lonely and desolate and hurtful and hard. And we're going, what is that? We get sick and tired of being sick and tired and we wonder about home, about what we knew was right, about the place where there was good and grace. And we wonder, I can't go home after what I've done. Maybe I can just move into the neighborhood and have it better than I have it now. And so eventually the prodigal came home. This is what Luke 15, 20 says. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. And filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. There's so much upside down in that story because normal would be the son would not go home, but he was humble enough to do what he said he'd never do. He humbled himself and went home just to get something, not to be restored where he was because he had violated so much, but to get something that was good of home. And he came home smelling like a pig. And this father, when he saw him, didn't run up to him and say, now I can punish you for insulting me and rebelling against everything that you knew was good and taking my resources and blowing it. Now I'm going to make you pay and you're gonna pay every penny back and it wasn't justice that the father was going to offer. It wasn't vengeance. <laughs> Instead, the father ran and filled with love and compassion, embraced him. I'm fortunate to come from a, a godly home where the embrace of my father was a good thing. And so I imagine that embrace from God the Father, who knows my worst and knows my past and knows my weaknesses, and while I'm still smelling like a pig, I come home just as I am, and he runs and embraces me. The story goes on, the son pushed away the father. I don't deserve this. I'm just gonna be your servant. And the father said, quick, bring the robe, bring the sandals, bring the ring, let's put a banquet together. My son is home. And we're going, no, 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 that's not me. I'm not your son anymore, I gave up my rights with my rebellion. But the God who knows everything about us runs and embraces us. I wish that you could daily lean into the embrace of God. He knows who you are, he knows what you've done, and he embraces you. And then he says, I'll help you. That's magic, that's amazing, and that's the redeeming truth that I received. And so I came to a town in need of God's grace, saying, I want you to receive the embrace of God. He knows what you've done, he knows where you've been, he knows the chapters of your life, and he runs to you. I hope you remember that. The second thing I want you to remember is very closely linked, and you'll see in a second, this is the Apostle Paul who is writing, and he was the apostle. He wrote most of the New Testament. He was the apostle of all the spiritual gifts. He was definitely a very powerful Christian, mature and wise and all of that. And yet in 1 Timothy, he says it this way about himself. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. 
For that re very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Just in case you missed it, Paul's calling himself the worst sinner. I am not a perfect man. Never have been. I'm flawed. I am a sinner. I'm comfortable saying that world in a culture that says nobody sins and everybody's right. I'm not, because I've known right and chosen wrong, and I've known wrong and done it anyway, and I've hurt people with my sin. And I'm not proud of that, and I don't just say that's okay. It's not okay. And it makes me sad that I've disappointed people and frustrated folks because I haven't been enough, or in my flesh or my weakness, I haven't done the right thing always. And when I've tried, when I've known about it, I've tried to make amends and seek reconciliation where it's possible, but it's always been a challenge. And I just want to say to anyone listening now that is one of those folks that I've hurt, I'm sorry, because my hope is to bring life, not hurt. And where I've brought hurt, I ask for forgiveness, because I'm a sinner saved by grace. And when I know that, and when you know that, and when we know that, it's amazing how that humility helps us all forgive each other and live life together. And I thank you for the grace that you've given me. So the prodigal son story, and I'm the worst of sinners, leads to the third idea I hope you never forget, and it's the room of grace. And the room of grace is an illustration that I came up with to try to help us understand God's amazing grace. And it comes from Romans 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we've been justified, which means declared innocent, therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. So what's your standing? What's your standing? Where do you stand? And what is it like if you stand in grace? Like it's a room. You're in the room or you're out of the room. If you're in the room, you're in. And the grace of God justifies us just as if we never sinned, declares us innocent when we receive his grace and we step just in the room, 100% forgiveness and acceptance. It's an amazing grace. And that's called justification. But sanctification is how holy am I, how cleaned up am I, and as I walk across the room and get closer to God, I have less sin in my life, so I have more joy and love and peace. And so it's good to grow in the holiness of God, become more like his, him and living his ways, but if I'm here, if I'm in further, I'm still 100% saved because I'm in grace. And there's security in grace, meaning if I'm in grace, I'm kept in grace by my faith. And as long as I have this saving faith, no matter if I'm just inside the door or all the way across the room, I'm in grace. And I want you to know you're standing. I want you to know where you're standing and what it means to be in God's room of grace. I want you never to forget that. There's one other thing I want you to remember, and this is not going to be a surprise. None of these, I hope, are surprises. But this one won't be. John 10.10, 10, except the last half of John 10.10. 10. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly, the ESV says. And I have come that they may have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of in the message translation. I've used the phrase a full, deep, and abundant life because it summarizes the concept. And I wish that for everyone because God is the, the author of life and sin brings death. And when redemption comes, what has been dead is brought back to life, now and lasting into eternity. And I will plead, I will be so grateful if you blame me for being the dude that put this, that seared this in your heart. Because that's what God wants for you, is a full life. I am so frustrated when I see people waste their one and only life. Waste their only one and only life in an addiction that's so sinful and hurtful versus living. And people that live for a shallow life where they go after things that are temporary versus living and serving people that are eternal. And one thing I hope you take away from this weekend is it is worth it. It is worth it to follow God in his ways. 
Seeking God first, obeying the Ten Commandments, forgiving others when they don't forgive you, tithing, sharing your faith with others, serving others. When you live out God's principles, it leads you into life, and not just a shallow life, a full, deep, and abundant life. And I praise God for the life that I've enjoyed because I have followed God's ways. And all I know is that life is available to everyone, not just pastor folks, everyone. So I hope you remember that. The joy of being part of God's family in this God thing, that there's some things I want you to remember, and now it's time for me to thank some people. Because it's right for me in this last opportunity to be grateful. And Paul, talking to another church, Philippians Church, the church at Philippi in Philippians 1.3, says it like this. I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I believe that. And so I want to say thanks specifically to our elder team that I've served with for these 25 years as being when we've had elders. 33 different individuals have been on our elder team in those 25 years. Godly people who have prayed hard, who have given wise discernment, who have said no, not yet, when it was time for me to hold up, who have challenged us to make sure our motives are pure with discerning uh, decisions that they have in their heart. These elders who have dived into the conflicts of our church to bring resolution, who have had to clean up the mess caused by leadership sin in our church, these people have given countless hours. I'm so grateful for being in the foxhole with each one of these, these folks who have prayed and led so well. I'm grateful for an operations team. Most of you don't even know we have one, and that's the point. Because these people do their work so well, the church is running well. They oversee our finances. They do our annual audit to keep us squeaky clean. They make sure our budgets are met and they, and they keep us financially healthy. They oversee our policies, our HR decisions, how we do contracts so we get great stewardship of our dollars. Uh, Troy Payton was one of our leaders for 10 years in, of the ops team. Chuck Kellogg was for about eight years. These days it's Leslie Hare, about six years she's been leading. And I just wanna say these people are amazing and they love our church and they give their gifts and help us in that way. I'm so grateful for the ops team. I'm grateful for the staff that has showed up and said I will make my life vocation helping lead this church. And I can't tell you, I mean, we're, now we have like 75 staff members or so, but I wanna acknowledge just some, not all of them, even though they all deserve it, but those that have been serving 10 years or longer. I wanna start with Susan Fuller, who's been on our staff 22 years. I wanna thank, now don't, she deserves it, and yeah, make sure she gets our accolades, but just for time's sake. Uh, Susan Fuller, 22 years. Ray Knott and, and Craig Ruff, 20 years on our staff. Mitch Harrison, 19 years on our staff. Galen Martin, 17 years. Garrett Fay and Steve Leed, 16 years. Alan Slaughter, 15 years. Scott Beck and Vicki O'Sullivan, 12 years. Lori Ruff and Larisha May Slaughter, 10, uh, 11 years. And Sandy Moore, 10 years. That's 13 staff of our 75 that have been here 10 years or more. Our current staff are just amazing folks who have said yes to Jesus to lead in this way in this season, which is very courageous. And it would have been 14 staff, but I'm quitting this weekend, so it's 13. Because <laughs> I've been on the staff longer than 10 years. Just thought you'd make, keep the record straight. I'm so grateful for our staff. I do want to point out a few folks through the years. On the keyboard today was Daryl Adcock. And Daryl Adcock was our first worship leader at Canyon Ridge in our first eight years. And, and just to give you an, uh, how much appreciation I have for him, for five years we were a set up and tear down church and we had two services a week. One on weekends at either the Y or Cimarron and one midweek at a couple churches we rented, West Oakey Baptist or Seventh-day Adventist, Adventist Church. Twice a week, set up and tear down to make a band sound good, to have lights, to have rehearsal, to have all the stuff that it took. It was resiliency and his grit and his character that kept him going. But you may have noticed he's a world-class talent. I mean, the way he plays keyboard, the way he orchestrates things, his music background and his voice are, are one in a million. And man, it means so much that Daryl was here this weekend. I'm so grateful for Daryl. 
I'm also honored uh, that Tom Englehart also came back. He was a worship leader here for seven years, and he came this weekend to be part of this honoring. What a joy to have Tom back as well. I'm grateful that my brother is here this week, and my brother and sister-in-law, Marsha and Kent, because my brother was on staff for six years here from 2000 to 2006, and it takes a great deal of humility to follow your younger brother who's the point leader of the church staff. And God is good, that's all I want to say, uh, he, <laughs> that he, God is gracious, he gives me what I don't deserve. But man, what a fun six years of memory. And Ken is such a church thinker, he understands, he was raised to love the church like I was. And the ripple effect of his thinking and his uh, initiatives are still changing lives currently in this church, more than any of you realize. And it's amazing, thank you, Ken. Doug Parks was on our church staff for 18 years as an executive pastor, and he was very pivotal in our building projects and, and doing them well and doing them with honoring as far as financially. Uh, he helped all the way from the canyons, the office building, the base camp, and this expansion in the chapel. His impact is still being felt on our church, and he's a man, he's an amazing man and a, and a great friend. Shane Phillip, who left, I already mentioned, six years on staff here, though, a student pastor, associate pastor, and now the lead pastor at the Crossing, good friend. Chris Duncan, who was on our staff for 12 years, and he was our student pastor and family pastor, and now he's the lead pastor of Crossroads Community Church in his hometown of Kokomo, Indiana. Those staff members are just so meaningful to me because we, we served and we fought together God's purposes, and they, uh, they'll never leave my heart. The current leadership team that's in place, I am so grateful, and I must thank them for how they have received the mantle of leadership and are moving forward. I am so grateful for our new lead pastor, Drew Moore. I am so grateful for him. I love Drew's heart. I love his family heritage from Illinois. I love his team more priority. That's his phrase, team more. And, and I forget what they do, like they bring life and help heal or something, in Jesus' name. He's, he's got a byline. It doesn't matter. I just love the team more priority of Lane and Luke and Nina and Miles and Zeke. And, and man, I'm so grateful for them. I'm grateful for his heart for discipleship. I'm grateful for his heart for the people of Las Vegas that he has grown in the last seven years. I'm grateful for how patiently he has received this handoff because he wants to lead, but he knew there was a time coming and he was very patient. And I'm so grateful with how he has honored Ginger and me and our family as we've done this exit. And I want to say to him again and to all of you, you got this. This church is in good hands, and I'm very excited for you and your leadership of the future. Now you can clap. That's a good one there. <laughs> I'm grateful for our current two Executive pastors, Mitch Harrison, who's been on staff 19 years, is one of the best behind the scenes leaders I've ever seen in action. And through this succession, he has been so careful as he's guided the staff and all of us in that direction. Uh, he's taken more arrows for this ministry than any other leader I know. And after 19 years, I'm very pleased to call Mitch a very good friend. Steve Wilson is our other executive pastor. He came to this church as a normal person, meaning married with a family and trying to love God. And they got involved by serving, and then he was asked on to the ops team where he served for six years. Then he was asked on to the elder team where he served for six years. Then he was asked on to the staff team where he served for six years. Seeing a pattern? And now he's an executive pastor overseeing our operations and our personnel, and he's a godly man. And so we have Mitch and Steve as our executive pastors, and that's awesome. I'm also grateful for Curtis and Christy, Thompson, uh, Curtis and Christy Templeton, who uh, have put together thoughtful and helpful services for us. Back when we announced Drew that he was gonna be the successor, they put that weekend together. Uh, back when we uh, installed Drew as the lead pastor, they put that weekend together, and this weekend they've put together. In our, the moments in our service, the people who are on stage, the songs have been selected, the moments of giving and, and talking and prayer, so carefully crafted, and it has helped our church in our heart as we transition, and I'm so grateful for their leadership here at the Ridge. I'm also grateful for you, the people of Canyon Ridge, and I am, I'm so grateful that you loved us and loved our family. I'm so grateful for everyone that volunteered in base camp because you helped raise my children. 
the youth sponsors poured into my kids, those leaders who took my kids on mission trips. I am so grateful for how you've discipled my children with Ginger and me. I'm grateful for the volunteer army of Canyon Ridge. And as I try to explain to my friends who aren't familiar with church about you, they are so unusually quizzical. It's like, so these people come, they just come and serve? Yeah, well, why? They're crazy. <laughs> that's, that's what I want to say. It's because they have a heart for God and others. And this is a place they can express that. And they see the value of it that they give away to others, that people in this church give money. You don't bill them. No, they donate. And not just a little, generously. And these buildings that have been built have been donated by people who know that what we donate isn't for us, it's for others. And the impact of others who aren't here yet. And that's amazing generosity. The volunteer army of this church, the generous heart of this church, is something that I deeply respect, and I thank you that I can tell others of that generosity in your heart for others. I thank you for inviting me into your pain. I'm a shepherd, but I don't know about your pain unless you let me know. And when you invited me to do your funerals, the funerals for your family and for your loved ones, that's a sacred privilege to get into that pain and try to help bring God's healing. When you're, there's been crisis in your life, in your marriage, in your family, and, and you needed a prayer, you needed some advice, and you, you ask, I treasure those moments that you trusted me with your pain. I also thank you for trusting me with your joys, at your moments of celebration where it'd be nice to have the pastor show up, for the weddings that I got to perform over this uh, 26 years, and the fun that those were, the baby dedications that have happened, and the joy that those weekends are. I just wanna say what a privilege it has been to serve you and to be your pastor. I also wanna thank, while I'm in the thanking mode, I need to thank my family. And I wanna thank Kristen, my 10-year-old, who has grown into such a great woman, a great Christian woman, a great wife, a great mother, and a great mama bear in her own right. She's a leader, she's a pioneer as the firstborn, and man, I'm so proud of you and the woman you've turned into. I'm grateful for Marcus, my six and a half year old son. Marcus has always had this huge heart, huge, he cares, and he tries hard and he works with all of his might. And he has translated that passion into being a great fifth grade school teacher over in, over in Fremont, California. And now he's married and he is going to celebrate his 10th anniversary in, in August. And he has three children that he is such a great dad, and he has a great wife, Nicola, added value to our family, just like Steve did as our son-in-law, Nicola as our daughter-in-law. And I'm so grateful for that family and what they mean and for Marcus's support. And Kelly, our little two-year-old that has thrived here, and you guys have raised her in school. She has such a tender heart for people. She's gone on all, like every mission trip the church ever offered for our students. She ended up having, being a two-year missionary in Thailand and Albania. She has such courage and her talents and gifts, and she sang on stage last night. Just make a smile, and I thank Kelly for her support. And I need to thank my wife. What a gift from God you are to me. The gift that I don't deserve. I don't think I ever can or will. You need to know that my wife is a good person, and I say that with exactly the full power of those two words. She is such a good human. She's very kind. And I've seen that expressed in so many ways on the behalf of the church. And it amazes me. And you are a mama bear, the fiercest one I've ever met. And now she's a fierce grand mama bear because she loves her grandkids. But I love how you have fought for our family. And the joy my family gives me these days is so deep and profound. And I owe it to you. And uh, you have been perfect for me. You're the one-of-a-kind wife that's been my rock. And I thank you. So maybe you've heard that I've talked about the joy of being part of a God thing. That's a deep joy. You've heard some things that I hope you never forget. 
and you've heard that I thanked a few people. So what's next? Tell me about the future. Well, this is one thing I know, change is coming. Surprised? Change is coming. Change is coming in our church. And you know what? It needs to. And why do I say that? There are some things that never change about the church. The, jo the doctrine of the church will not change. The mission of this church will not change. The values of this church will not change. But how, what is the part that changes? How we communicate it to a culture that is rapidly changing must change or we become irrelevant. And we can't let that happen because God's ways need to be lived out in this current culture. And so this new generation needs to understand God's grace and language that they can connect with so that they experience the freedom that we have found. Uh, we have said throughout the years that seek and save the lost is our mission statement, which is Jesus' mission statement, and we've joined him in that. The new way we say that for this current generation is we're joining Jesus to bring life to everyone, everywhere, every day. Same mission, new and fresh words. The come as you are banner that was on our building for so long is the prodigal son story where we can come just like we are, smelling like a pig and embrace the grace of God. That is still 100% true, but you heard some fresh words last month in the series after Easter when the series was called This is for Everyone. The message never changes. The methods must. And so change is coming to this church, the right kind of change. And I trust the current leadership that they're not going to change things just to change things. Not because it would be hip and trendy. They're going to change things with purpose and values that will extend who God and, and what God wants us to do here. And I trust that. And I hope you will too as, as changes come. I trust the leadership. To, by the way, just as a just quick reminder, 1993 when the church started, how, how many of you had cell phones? You ever heard of the internet back then? It was just starting. Change has happened. We must stay current as well. So I pray that the message never changes, but the methods will. And that's what's next for you, but what's next for us? Some of you uh, care about that question, so what are we doing? After the dust has settled and a lot of thinking, we're staying in Las Vegas for all the right reasons. We have two daughters here and three grandsons, and we kind of like them, and we're enjoying watching them grow up. Our son in California and his family, we like them too, but it's better, it's cheaper to visit them than to live there or to have two homes. So we're going to live here, visit there, and uh, that's what we're going to do in the next run. But we are going to take a break from uh, the Canyon Ridge Church family. Uh, and the reason we're going to do that is because it's wise. That's what we've been told by folks who have coached other people through this kind of a succession in a church. And I'm so thankful for the strength and health of this succession transition and how well it's gone. And so I'm so grateful for that, and it helps us as we exit for this season. But it's right for Drew and the current team of leaders to lead going forward without distraction. It's right for you as a church family to gain confidence in this new leadership team and realizing how strong and, and how God's going to use them in a powerful way in this, as this God thing continues. But here's another thing. It's right for me. What do you mean? Well, I'm grieving, leaving. It's not something I want to do. It's something I'm doing because it's right. And because of that, I want to do it, not because it's what I want to do. It's the right thing to do. And when you make the right kind of choices, exiting a place that you love, there is a grief that I'm just going to have for a long time. And those of you that, that know uh, this counsel, when I deal with a spouse who has lost a spouse, over death or divorce. My counsel to all of them always is, wait a year before you reattach. Just give your heart a whole year, all four seasons, to grieve and to heal before you attach too quickly when you're not done healing and you're not whole and healthy and ready to move forward. And so guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna take my own medicine and we're gonna detach for a year. And we're not going to be around the ridge in public settings. We're still going to be alive. You're going to run into us and say, oh, he's not dead. No, <laughs> we'll be in town and just treat us as Kevin and Ginger, normal, normal people and normal relationships. But we're not going to formally be a part of church. I'm going to visit some of my buddy's churches in town. And I'm going to, we're going to watch online. We're going to visit our aging parents back east. Uh, so we'll, we'll be busy. We have, we have stuff to do. But just so you know, we're going to wait a year. And our plan is to come back here in a year and be part of this church because this is our favorite church. 
But for our heart's sake and for yours, we're going to wait a year. So what are we going to do now? That's a great question. So in the past, I've told you about my life plan that I took a couple years ago. And Shepherding Kingdom Leaders is the specific. God's given me a gift of shepherding, and I have been, I have understood the role of leadership at a senior level. And I believe in the kingdom of God, and I've told you this, all the seven spheres of culture that add, add influence. There were some Christian thinkers about 50, 60 years ago who talked about the seven pillars of society or the seven mountains or the seven spheres, and these are supposed to be mountains. And these seven spheres, of, yeah, right. This is the last one. Enjoy it, all right? So anyway, <laughs> so <laughs> the seven spheres of culture, that if good is being led in these spheres, our culture is healthier and full of life. And when good stops being done, evil prevails. And if I can be a part of shepherding them, the leaders of each one of these spheres, each mountaintops, so that they can keep leading and doing good, that's what I want to do. Business, what if every business was a healthy, godly business, meaning that they blessed their employees and had integrity and all of that? What about our government, if they defended the rights of innocent people and were good stewards of our resources? What about the education in our culture, that it was robust and healthy and really lifted folks and was accountable? What about faith? The places of faith that redeem and every church was healthy. What about family, that families were strong? What about arts, entertainment, and sport? And we had role models that we could say to our kids, be like them, like a Tim Tebow. And like media, that media was held a power accountable and ha- didn't have an agenda so they could be objective. What if all of these were healthy? What would society be like if all of the leaders here were doing good? And one of my griefs is when a leader crashes and burns because they burn out or a leader disqualifies themselves because their temptation life led them into deep sin, or if somebody was wounded and they bleed out because they are just so hurt by the events of their leadership. What if I could come alongside and help these leaders stay leading with full hearts so good could prevail? And that's what it means to me to be a shepherding kingdom leader. I'm gonna actually uh, go into business, believe it or not, in this business world and take care of some CEOs so that they can be godly leaders, good leaders, and uh, I pray that they will thrive and their leadership will bless their people, and that's what I hope happens. So now I have an LLC. Yes, I do. And I didn't even know what they were. No, that's not true, I knew. But uh, the heart of a leader is the name of my LLC because I want the heart of the leaders that I can influence to be strong and vibrant so from that place of strength they can do good and bless those that they lead. And that's what I hope it happens in this next chapter. So, plus I'll also be shepherding pastors and, uh, and other profit, uh, CEOs of nonprofits. So that's kind of what I hope happens. So here we go. That's fine. Thank you. So that's a lot of information, and thank you for giving me the grace to tell it all to you. So hopefully you got it. So here we go, the final goodbye. So what are my wishes and hopes for you. Uh, Philippians 4.1 in the message translation says this, my dear, dear friends, I love you so much. I do want the very best for you. And you make me feel such joy and fill me with such pride. Don't waver. Stay on track. Steady in God. That's my wish for you. You're in good hands with Pastor Drew and our elder team and our ops team and our staff. And I say one more time, you've got this. And the vision isn't fully accomplished. The vision of looking at the lights of Las Vegas and knowing every home needs God's grace in it. And not every home has God's grace yet. So we must be about what our God has called us to do. And so I pray that you will go forward fulfilling that vision of extending God's grace into a desperate world that needs it. And so to conclude, I'd like to pray a blessing on you. If you would, please stand as I pray this blessing. God, it's an honor to stand over this people and ask for a blessing from you to them. It has been such a joy to have that responsibility, and I thank you for the blessing it's been to me. But I pray a blessing upon the folks here. I pray for the vision of every home being a home of grace and goodness, that that will be lived out as we carry your grace into a lost and dying world. God, I pray for Drew. I pray for his life and his health and his wisdom, his courage, 
to be strong and that the grace that has been shown me by this church will be extended to Drew as he leans into leadership. Protect him and give him grace. I pray for each person in this audience, everyone listening online, that you know their name and you know their story. And I pray that they know that they can lean into your embrace. And that's how you feel for them as the Father. God, I pray that more and more there will be full, deep, and abundant life lived in every heart, every life, every home. And I pray for everyone as they join Jesus in bringing life to everyone, everywhere, every day. And now I want to pray the priestly prayer from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.